Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have a wonderful show for you this evening. Mike Bush is here again. We're going to talk all sorts of subjects on maintenance, how to protect your aircraft, and how to save you money. Now, before we get started, as always, a few notes. One of the things I'd love to do is take a quick moment here and share uh, some news. We have our Fly to Win Challenge winner from Social Flight for November. It's Addison Tower of Grays Lake, Illinois, who won a Lightspeed Zulu 3 headset uh, with our Fly to Win Challenge. Uh, so, so cool about that. So congratulations there to Addison. And, um, you know, Lightspeed's been such a wonderful partner, and I'd let direct people to take a look. They have a program going on right now um, that really focuses on survival. And as we get further and further into the winter months, at least for those of us in the northern latitudes of the country, uh, it's really important to uh, uh, keep an eye out there and know what you need to do uh, in order to uh, survive and get tips for that. And so if you go to Lightspeed's uh, website just uh, at Lightspeed Aviation. Um, there's a blog there and they have some really, really great stuff, including some information on the pilots who walked away from the miracle on Mount St. Helens. And so um, be sure to check that out. Um, that's, uh, the, that, that's really cool. So shout out and thank you to Lightspeed. Again, for now moving forward, we are continuing the Fly to Win Challenge with our friends at Tempest Aero, where we have a complete prize pack of products from Tempest, complete set of uh, spark plugs and more. And so um, very, very cool things happening there. And, um, and so really looking forward to, um, uh, to that. So um, uh, with that, sorry, just had to make sure everything was going well. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to give a few more notes. Feel free to use our Q and A feature here. Uh, post your questions. We don't uh, don't have the ability with Mike to ask specific questions about your aircraft, but we can do everything possible to uh, fit in those general topics. And I like to use that to help steer our discussion during the show. Uh, so that we can introduce new points and focus things on topics that are really relevant to you there in the audience. And speaking of that, of course, we are here for you. Social Flight was created to support pilots, to give you tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. And of course, when the pandemic hit, we uh, really focused a lot on online events like tonight's show as well. And we started Social Flight Live to give you this form to get together and be able to hear from some of the most inspirational guests in general aviation. So we have Mike Bush tonight, and then of course we're coming up, we've got uh, the Appar uh, Apario president, Chris Garberg coming up, Ariel Tweedo from Flying Wild Alaska is coming up, and even Elvis's pilot, Ron Strauss. So with that, I would like to begin the show with Mike. Mike is CEO of Savvy Aviation. Mark is our, uh, Mike is arguably the best known AMP and IA in general aviation, and I am thrilled to call him a friend and also a coworker. He founded Savvy Aviation in 2008 to provide aircraft maintenance and management and consulting services to thousands of aircraft owners, including pre-buy management, innovative engine monitor analysis, and 24 seven breakdown assistance. That's essentially AAA 4GA. In addition to this and all of those pre-buy services and getting so much help, he also has authored hundreds of articles and four books on aircraft ownership and maintenance. And as I bring Mike on the line right now, tonight he is here to talk about saving you money with your aircraft maintenance. Uh, welcome, Mike. Thanks for joining us here on Social Flight Live. You bet, Jeff. Hey, can I ask you for a favor, please? You got it. Well, would you put my name in the fishbowl for, for like two dozen Tempest spark plugs and a dozen of oil filters? I, I'd really appreciate that. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure you're a social flight user. And when you, whoever wins this gets a complete set, single twin, doesn't matter. You get a set of spark plugs, oil filters, everything. Um, knowing you, you put your name in there, they'll probably shoot you some fine wires. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy with, I'm happy with the massives, but um I just want to make sure my my name's in the in the pot. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, so um, 
let's start here with one of the biggest things that you know uh, that that we see come across the desk at Savvy, and and we'll keep talking about Savvy all night long because it is just such a wonderful service. Uh, it seems to me that th there's almost these ten commandments of good, responsible aircraft ownership and maintenance. And one of them seems to be like, go slowly and go logically into every problem. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's one of our, our mantras. And, and it's, it's very frustrating to me how, um, how frequently we see situations where um, uh, our clients put their airplane in the shop for an annual inspection. And if, you know, if, if there's a little metal in the oil filter, the mechanic says, oh, we're going to have to overhaul the engine or at least tear down the engine. Um, if, 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 if there's marginal compression on a cylinder, oh, the cylinder's going to have to come off. And, you know, it, there's just this tendency to immediately jump to the most expensive, most invasive possible remedy, rather than you know take things step by step, and it's mm -hmm. it's like it's like oh you got a call we're we're gonna have to send you to search and cut you open. I mean it just doesn't make sense, um, and so we always do our very best to put the brakes on that sort of thing and say no not well, it's not, not so fast. First of all, let's gather some data and find out what's going on. If there's metal in the filter let's send it to the lab and find out what kind of alloy it is. See if we can figure out where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if there's, if there's a compression problem, let's stick a bore scope in the cylinder and look around and figure out, you know, where the air is leaking out and, and what we can do about it. Um, we, we just had a, just had a client. Um, I'm trying to remember what he was, he was flying a twin of some sort. And he just put the airplane in annual the, air, the engine had about 500 hours on it, and the mechanic did a compression check and told him he was going to have to change two cylinders. And he'd already changed seven cylinders, so these would this would be number eight and number nine. And 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 the the client you know posted the ticket and he says, "What am I doing wrong?" And the answer is, "You're pulling too many cylinders. That's what you're doing wrong." You know, none of this has anything to do with how 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 he was flying the airplane. It, it what it all had to do is the fact that his mechanic had an itchy trigger finger when it came to pulling yeah. cylinders. You know, and so we 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 had there was one one cylinder that was that 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 had low compression in, and and this was really low compression. I mean, it was it was below the master orifice threshold, so it was disqualifying from a continental standpoint. There was one that was leaking past the exhaust valve, and and we said, well, let's let's try lapping the valve in place. And the mechanic said, well, I've never done that, you know. So we found another mechanic who had done that and was comfortable with it. And he went in and lapped the valve in place, and it brought the compression up about 20 points instantly. And the other one was leaking air past the past the rings, and when we looked at it with the bore scope, it it was barrel was pretty worn. It, that cylinder looked like it was well used. Um, but we said, well, you know, before we pull a cylinder, let's let, let's just try doing a solvent ring flush to just to just wash the crud out of the out of the ring pack and see what that does. So we did a, a solvent ring flush and it it brought the compression up um, not dramatically, but about ten or twelve points, and it was enough to, to to be qualifying. And so, he wound up getting through the annual without putting pulling any cylinders. But mm -hmm. you know, it's it's very rare that that mechanics will try to do that. I mean, not, not, I shouldn't make a blanket statement because there are some mechanics who, who who do this, but most we find it just you know if something's wrong, the cylinder has to come off. If, if the engine's making metal, it has to the case has to be split. And you know that's to me that's very wasteful. And um, I have this sneaking suspicion that if the same thing happened to an airplane that was owned by the mechanic himself, he might not be so trigger happy about pulling things apart. 
as he as he is on on a, on a customer's airplane. Right. Well, it seems it it seems there's a few things at work here. Um, on the mechanics part and on the shops part, there's often either uh, either an outsourcing and workload and comfort zone that 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 makes you want to compartmentalize something and just group it together and send it out whether it's a, a mag or a cylinder or even a complete engine. And then there's a the liability side also that makes the mechanic approach it that way. And, and from a pilot and an aircraft owner's perspective, uh, we, we know that mechanics perspective, there's lots of flaws in that thinking. And there's also lots of flaws in the thinking that some pilots and some owners have that if I just jump to the, to step five in this process or step 10 in this process, as if everything went wrong in between, I'm somehow miraculously guaranteed safety. Yeah. And, 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 and not only safety, but an end to maintenance for like five years. Like if I just, if I just do this thing you're saying, I can just forget about it. And it seems like both of those arguments seem to be wrong. Well, there's a lot. There's a lot to process in what you just said. <laughs> uh, first, first of all, you, you you touched on the issue of liability, which I think uh, is behind an awful lot of what's wrong with GA maintenance. Is is is, is uh, mechanics concern about liability, um, and it, if if a mechanic repairs something and it doesn't work out, then the mechanic's on the hook for it. If the mechanic sends something out, let's say sends an engine out to an engine shop or a prop out to a prop shop, then the mechanic's pretty much off the hook and the liability is transferred to the prop shop or the engine shop. And and, and so I think a lot of this of this let's 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 pull it off the airplane and send it out mentality has to do maybe subconsciously. With, with the desire to 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 make it somebody else's problem and and mm -hmm. not 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 incur the liability, um, you know. And then the 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 last thing you were talking about this notion of well, you know, if 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 there's metal in the filter, the owner is now scared of the engine, and if he sends it out for overhaul he won't be scared anymore, which is because he believes that, you know, uh, the, the, the newly overhauled engine is somehow going to be more reliable than his trusty old engine, <laughs> when all the statistics show exactly the opposite, you know, that, that when you analyze um, uh, power loss accident information, the overwhelming majority of power loss accidents occur with young engines, not old engines. Mm -hmm. um, but but somehow or other, there's this this belief that you know if if we just you know if we just overhaul the thing, it's 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 going to become perfectly reliable again, and that turns out not to be the case. That the the risk of infant mortality failure. It's really much more serious than the risk of age-related failure. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, infant mortality failures seem to happen more often, but also there's there are different in kind. The, the age-related problems with engines tend to telegraph themselves, you know, long before they actually get to the point of failure. And if you're paying attention you know if you're cutting open your filters and you're doing oil analysis and you're bore scoping your cylinders these age-related failures aren't going to sneak up on you and catch you unawares you'll see them coming a mile away infant mortality failures are, are, are just the opposite they, they they happen suddenly and without any warning and 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 they're the ones that are going to make you fall out of the sky and the, the, you know we have the data to prove that so yeah um you know, owners, if if they really understood the problem, would be very reluctant to have their engine overhauled, mm -hmm. and then because what they have is a known quantity, right? And, and what they're exchanging it for is an unknown quantity. Yeah. Um, but they, but but most owners don't look at it that way. I I always get a kick out of you know I, I talk to so so many mechanics all over the place, and I, I've had so many mentors, including yourself, of course. 
And I love, it puts a huge smile on my face anytime, for example, that I'm dealing with some of these, these like crusty guys that have been around forever, that have incredible decades of experience in the field, been working on these things forever. Because when you ask them some of these questions like, hey, can you take a look at this filter? Uh, that's got some metal in it. Can you take a look at, you know, this uh, prop that's got some oil coming out? They seem to come at it from a completely different perspective. They're not like, uh, I think I see two flakes. Let's 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 pull the jug. You know, they're like, I don't think you're anywhere near going into bypass on this oil filter yet. Yeah. Like, no, exactly. like they're concerning about catastrophic things. I had a spray of oil out of a prop, and 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 the mechanic, the, the guy who I I absolutely love, looked at that, and he's like. Are you having any problems seeing out of the front? <laughs> <laughs> right. I had a wonderful experience with where I had a, a prop that was was throwing oil, and um, uh, and I'd had several recommendations that the prop ought to go out for overhaul because of that, and and so I took it to a prop shop in San Luis Obispo with a, one of these guys like you're describing who's been doing this like forever and ever. And, he, he he looked at the prop and he pulled the spinner off, looked inside and he said, you know, he says, oh, I'm, I'm not particularly worried about it. And I said, well, what should I do? He said, carry a rag. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was great. Yeah. That's my well, kind of, that's my, my kind of prop guy. <laughs> but, you know, it, it, all joking aside, what you were saying earlier is what leads into this. And that is, the, these are not necessarily, they make for funny stories, but they're not necessarily just jokes. They're yeah. looking at this and saying, the situation that you're dealing with is something we know. It's something that we know we can watch. We know it's incremental in nature. And that is is a better known quantity in certain cases than doing something more dramatic. Um, and and what the consequences of that could be? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and and that one of the basic tenets of the you know kind of reliability centered maintenance philosophy that I espouse and follow ha has to do with focus on consequences. That you know there are all sorts of failures that we deal with 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 the hardware that we fly, but most of the failures. Um, are not ones that will get anybody hurt, are not ones that will, you know, get you stuck somewhere that you don't want to be. They're not ones that 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 uh, can cause expensive collateral damage if they're not dealt with right away. They're they're tolerable failures. They're acceptable failures, and um, the the RCM philosophy basically says for acceptable failures, we don't try to prevent them. We just let them happen. It's called a run to failure philosophy. And, you know, so for example, um, I fly a twin Cessna. It's got two fairly expensive uh, uh, vacuum pumps on it. That, that run the de-icing boots used to run gyros. I finally got rid of the last air-driven gyro, thank goodness. But um, and you know the manufacturers of those vacuum pumps want those vacuum pumps to be retired every 500 hours. Well, I mean, if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense for me, for sure, because the failure of a vacuum pump is an acceptable failure. I have two vacuum pumps. Either one will run all the systems that it needs to run. So the failure of a vacuum pump is an acceptable failure. So why would I retire a vacuum pump um, without getting every last bit of life out of it that I can? Mm -hmm. uh, and the flip side is if someone, let's say, were changing them uh, every few hundred hours or something like that, there have been significant issues in how the alternator coupling is attached. And if a maintenance yeah. failure, is, if, if, if a mistake is made in the way that that is done, or it, it, in something along those lines, 
that in itself has had very consequential failures for flight. Right. You're talking about the the, the gear driven alternators on on. Um, I, I have to. It's on my panels, really like guys. <laughs> like 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 the one on your Bonanza or the ones on my Twin Cessna, and um, it turns out that mounting that little gizmo that you had in your hand, which it, which which is the alternator drive coupling, to the alternator shaft, is a very very tricky proposition. And if you screw it up, you can wind up destroying the engine. And we've we've lost a bunch of engines due due to um, mechanic error in installing that that drive coupling. And unfortunately, anytime you send an alternator out for overhaul, you, you have to remove the drive coupling, send the alternator out for overhaul, and then when you get it back, you have to put the drive coupling back on and 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 torque that castellated nut just right and, and trim the cotter pin just right so it doesn't foul mm -hmm. the ring gear and stuff. And it's it it's you know, it's sort of an an opportunity to screw up. It's 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 definitely not idiot proof. Yeah. And we've seen a bunch of problems. So that's why I'm just not really a big fan of prophylactically pulling alternators up off of these engines. Yeah. And and I mean I'll um, take that opportunity because we've spoken a lot about that. And then, and for anyone who's flying behind the continental uh, large engines that have geared alternators, that is a perfect example that, yeah. that putting putting this guy on Ha, is problematic and you have it's really careful it, as you said it's so important to your engine that it be done properly and yet the manual says you have to build a tool you have to weld together a tool in order to do it and so i mean i'll do our own plug on, on this that we literally for the safety of that came up with a, a special tool uh that that does that you know at approach aviation just just to do that and the only reason i bring that up is because that's literally like the life cycle of creating that tool was maintenance being done proactively, but without the right tools was actually breaking engines. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, I'd like to s s back up a little bit because one, another part of the philosophy that you have that I really uh, like and I wish more people could understand and embrace is looking at the engine in a very modular way and not feeling like it's just one blob that everything has to lead to everything else and you have to jump to overhaul. That the, the cylinders should be thought of separately from the bottom end, that the accessories should be thought of completely separate so that even if one fails, even if you have a problem that includes uh, contamination, you you don't just jump to ripping everything apart. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a per perfect example that I, I just see so much, you got a Continental engine that's got 1,500 hours on it and it's starting to burn a ton of oil. Um, and the t very common reaction to that is, well, it, the, it's getting long in the tooth, I guess we better overhaul it. Now, first of all, it doesn't make sense at all because um, oil consumption is a cylinder-related problem. Oil consumption never requires, you know, uh, splitting the case and dealing with the bottom end. It is a top-end problem. It's it's in the hot section of the engine, and and both Continental and Lycoming and Franklin and a bunch of other people cleverly designed their engines so that the cylinders came off. So. For sure, we don't have to split the case on this engine to cure its oil consumption problem. This is a cylinder-related problem. Um, and it probably isn't all the cylinders. We probably could do, could gather a little data and figure out which cylinder is the culprit here. Mm -hmm. And then once we figure out which cylinder is the culprit, it doesn't necessarily have to come off. Maybe it right. does, but there are a bunch of things we can try short of open heart surgery um, before we make the decision that the cylinder needs to come off. Um, right. so, so you mentioned two different techniques I want to make sure people hear more about because as you, again, going down and down the modular path, even when you isolate the cylinder, you at Savvy view the cylinder as separate components. If, if the rings are the problem, you've got solvent flush, like to hear about that, 
if the exhaust valve is a problem, you've got lapping. I'd like to hear about that. Right. So now these these two techniques that you mentioned, which are are almost completely non-invasive techniques and don't involve pulling very much apart, um, they don't always solve the problem, but they're always worth a try. Um, lapping the valve in place, we've had extremely good success rate in in solving um, compression problems related to leakage past the exhaust valve uh, by, by lapping the valve in place. Which Can you does, describe that process really briefly for people? Yeah, very briefly. It, it just involves, you know, removing the rocker cover and the, and the, the, the rocker and the valve springs to free up the valve. Uh, and removing uh, the exhaust riser to that cylinder so that you can get access to the exhaust port. And, and then you insert a little valve grinding compound in through the exhaust port and you, um, you spin the valve with, a, with an electric drill that you couple to the valve with a, with a little piece of hose. And you do that you know, several times until, until, the thing, until the thing seals well, and until you've got um, I mean, when when a when a valve starts to leak, and and you look at the at, at the the sealing surface of the valve, the back side of the valve where it, that which contacts the seat, I mean, you should see a nice shiny ring around the valve where that contact is, and 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 typically with a leaky valve, you see an area of it that looks kind of dull because it isn't sealing quite right, and so just lapping the valve in place with a little valve grinding compound will we'll typically clean that up. It will also remove uh, any uh, lead deposits and uh, so on from the, the valve seat that might be interfering with the valve closing completely. Um, and we've had very good success in, 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 in restoring uh, compression where the loss is past the exhaust valve by doing that. And it's a much, much simpler and much less risky procedure than, than, than removing the cylinder and sending it out. Um, now, before we do that, we, we stick a bore scope in the engine, take a look at the valve. And when we look at the valve with the bore scope, we can tell how far gone it is. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the valve has, has burned to the point where there's a lot of metal erosion or where the valve is, is clearly starting to warp, then it's probably be beyond the point where we're, where we're going to be able to rescue it with lapping, and in, in that case, we'll say, yeah, the cylinder needs to come off because this this burn valve has has just gone too far uh, mm -hmm. to to be resolved that way. And what that really tells me is that that engine hasn't been getting bore scoped on a regular basis because if it had been, you would have caught this problem. Right. earlier and you wouldn't have to have the cylinder come off but 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 we we don't have to guess whether the lapping is going to work we can look with a bore scope and tell whether the valve is only slightly sick or whether it's you know mortally wounded and and decide the, the approach there the the ring wash is an interesting procedure um it, it's 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 even simpler than the than 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 lapping the valves. In fact, it's it's so simple that I think it would qualify for preventive maintenance that 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 an aircraft owner could do himself without getting an A and P involved, really. But basically, what it it consists of is, um, it, and I'll describe it for one cylinder, but we typically will do it on, on all cylinders. Um, but it consists of removing the top spark plug, rotating the prop so that the piston is at bottom dead center and about to come up on the compression stroke, and then pouring a solvent mixture. And I've got I've got this all documented on on the Savvy website that with the concoction of what's in the solvent mixture. But pouring a solvent mixture in through the top spark plug hole to fill up the combustion chamber, then replacing the top spark plug and pulling the prop through the compression stroke and and basically the prop's going to be very hard to turn because the combustion chamber is full of fluid and so the only way the piston can come up is for that fluid to 
get past the ring pack and through the little oil feed holes in the piston. And so by, by, by pulling the prop through with the combustion chamber full of this solvent, uh, we're basically forcing the, the any, any uh, sludge and stuff that has built up in, in the ring grooves or in those little oil feed holes um, out. And if the procedure is successful, then then the way then what happens is the first time you do it, the prop is very, very hard to to move. And then you do then you wash it again and you wash it a third time, and each time it gets it gets freer and freer. And and when everything is is perfect, you can just hear the fluid squirting through the little holes as you pull the prop through. And 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 it doesn't take a tremendous amount of force to pull the prop through once you've cleaned all the all the junk out. Now again, if if things have gone too far and the rings are so sludged up that the solvent wash can't dis dislodge the sludge, um, then the, the rotating the prop won't, won't get freer and you won't hear that nice satisfying squirt. But it was still worth doing because what it's done is it's pinpointed the problem. It's told you this cylinder definitely has very badly sludged up rings, and that's what's causing your oil consumption problem. And at that point, we know the cylinder should come off and the piston is gonna have to get cleaned up and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, it, you know, doing the ring wash isn't always going to be successful in, in dislodging the stuff. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but either way, it's a great, it, it, it's a great piece of di you know diagnostic tool because it 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 tells you the condition of the of of the ring pack on the piston and and whether yep. there's a lot of sludge in there or not. Um, we 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 see this problem a great deal on um, airplanes like the Cirrus uh, or the Columbias uh, that that have big bore engines with unusually small oil sumps. You know, the, Cir the Cirrus is powered by an IO550 and most IO550s have a 12 quart sump, but the Cirrus engine uh, has only an eight quart sump. And nobody ever fills it more than six quarts because if you do, you know, any, any excess over six gets tossed out the breather in short order. So you're asking a very small amount of oil to absorb the 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 lead blow by, uh, and it, it, it's it's hard to do that. I think I think if the truth be known, engines like that with a very small oil sump really ought to get the oil changed more often, mm -hmm. uh, be, because a, it's a small amount of oil is being asked to to absorb a large amount of particulate material uh, to right. to to prevent it from. From sledging up the engine, and 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 the the worst cases we see are airplanes like Cirruses that are operated on uh, Aeroshell 15W50, which is a semi-synthetic oil uh, that's half petroleum and and half synthetic, and the synthetic can't handle lead sludge at all. So effectively, that six quarts really only can absorb as much particulate material as as three quarts of of dead dinosaur type oil, and so th those those engines we we see a lot of problems where where the, the engine will start burning oil prematurely, um, and uh, yeah. the, the problem is that the uh, the rings, particularly the oil control ring, are are, are terminally sledged up. So well, if we catch you... it if we catch it early enough, maybe we can cure it with a ring wash. If we don't catch it early enough, at least the ring wash will identify what cylinders have the problem. What what do you say to to owners who um, you know when they do approach their mechanics they find that that the types of procedures that you're talking about uh, being you know the first steps whether it be uh, you know I, we've all probably heard them you know there's there's mechanics that are uncomfortable with valve grinding they're like I, I, that's not safe to have the compound how do you get the compound out of there or solvent and they're like well, what are the ramifications how does the solvent come out of that and 
and, and not you know dilute the oil and there's all sorts of hesitations out there you know by the way you know, the, the, the answer to your question about well how do you get the how do you get the grinding compound out of there which is a question that comes up a lot is you start the engine <laughs> <laughs> And it will be very vigorously blown out of there. It's not a problem. So how how do I guess the bigger question is how does someone be a better advocate with their shop to try to follow these kind of guidelines you're talking about? Well, you know, one one of the things that that I think are I feel very strongly about that our role, one of our big roles in savvy is is to educate, and we we try to educate mechanics uh, although some mechanics are ineducable <laughs> but and we try to educate aircraft owners the aircraft owners are a little bit more motivated to be educated because they're the ones that, that wind up paying the bills mm -hmm. um but but owners are funny too because on on one hand they they they, they would like to be smarter about maintenance and on the other hand we, we run into a lot of fear that that mm -hmm. leads to in, irrational maintenance decisions the kind yeah. of thing we were talking about earlier where you say i'll sleep better at night if i overhaul my engine and, and that may not make any sense but there, there's a certain right. something to be said for being able to sleep better at night so so i tend to you know honor that and say okay you know that was well that's, your, it, hey, it, that's not that's more, not what i would do if it was my airplane but 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 it's not my airplane it's your airplane so well, well, I guess it depends on what makes someone sleep at night, right? Because for the yeah. for the owner, they're rationalizing that whatever this brand new thing they put on their plane, uh, whether it be a, a, an engine or a component or something on the airframe, whatever it is, they're they're rationalizing it's brand new. I can sleep at night. I have nothing to worry about. No, I you know I I tell owners that the time you the time time you should have trouble sleeping at night is the first hundred hours after a new engine goes on the airplane. Right. Uh, although for those of us, right, like like you and I, that get all of the a uh, all the ads mailed to us by our FISDO rep, like every single day, mm -hmm. we, I look at that and and like sit there and go, anytime I put something completely brand new on my plane, I'm just thinking, oh God, when's the ad coming out that says that there was a nut on this that was like the wrong way or something like that. Yeah. Which you yeah. know, after 20 years, something's been on there. You're not likely to get that AD note. <laughs> That's right. And you know, the, the the thing about this this the time you should be nervous is the first hundred hours after the new engine goes on. Um, if you pose the question differently, you wind up getting a different answer. If you if you go to the owner and say, "Hey, Let's conduct this thought experiment. I just handed you the keys to a brand spanking new Cirrus SR22T just rolled out of the factory, and I would like you to fly it to France, please. And most of them will say, you know, I'd feel a little better crossing the pond after we got maybe 100 hours on the engine. And that's exactly the right reaction, of course, you know. But 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 somehow or other, if if it doesn't involve going to France, the thought process is frequently reversed in, in owners' minds. Yeah, very uh, very very interesting. Um, another area which seems to to uh, steamroll things is when we get back to talking about uh, metal, which is always the big worry. That that that's it. You know, you open up the filter, you're worried, you're worried. What are you going to see? And the idea that that is a, a on one hand, to some people, like a light switch, there's metal in it, we're overhauling, or we're yanking something, versus it being an incremental investigation and something that can, you know, is dealt with, isn't the end of everything. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's first of all, it's, it's not unusual to find metal in the filter. And um Lycoming actually has uh, some very very good uh, service bulletins that talk about how to appropriately respond to a finding of metal in the filter that that suggests you know a very graduated approach it says you know if it's if it's up to nine pieces of metal in the filter uh and and, and none of the pieces of metal are over a sixteenth of an inch 
uh, in, 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 in maximum dimension, then it's a non-event, don't worry about it, just fly the engine and do the normal oil change in 50 hours or whatever. And if it's between 10 and 19 pieces of metal, then maybe maybe change the oil and cut the filter in 25 hours. And then it, it just kind of goes up the, the ladder about the, the more metal we see, the more cautious we, we want to be. And if there's quite a bit of metal, then we, we really want to go not fly the airplane, but go ground run it for 30 minutes and then cut the filter. And, 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 and then it finally gets to the end where it says if it's more than a quarter of a teaspoon of metal, then, then, then maybe we shouldn't, we, we shouldn't operate the engine until we can figure out where the metal came from. Um, and a quarter teaspoon of metal is a gigantic amount of metal. If you saw a quarter of a teaspoon of metal in your filter, you wouldn't even think about starting the engine. Um, Continental, unfortunately, has no similar guidance. And I've, I've begged and pleaded with them to, to come out with a similar service bulletin because that's the service bulletin that, that helps us guide mechanics to, to do the right thing and not overreact to the finding of a small amount of metal. And, and Continental has, has not been willing to come out with a similar service bulletin and they claim their legal department won't let them do it or something. And um, so when we, when, when we have a client that has metal in the filter and a Continental engine, we, 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 we try to persuade the mechanic that we probably ought to follow the Lycoming guidance because at least that's some guidance and Continental provides no guidance. And, uh, but it's a harder sell, obviously, yeah. to, to, to do that. Um, but, you know, the other thing that we frequently do that very, very few mechanics would do w without, you know, us sort of pushing them to do it is to, is to have the, the filter content sent out to a laboratory for scanning electron microscopy which sounds very scary, but it costs about 125 bucks. And it comes back with a report that says, you know, here's, here's what we found in terms of what the alloy was um, and, and what the quantity was and what the shape and size was of everything, but most importantly, what the alloy is. And from the alloy, we can pretty much very frequently anyway tell where the metal's coming from because you know, if the, the, the lifters are made of chilled cast iron and they're the only thing in the, in the engine that are made of chilled cast iron. And the camshaft is made of a, of, of a very um, high chrome uh, alloy that, that is quite distinctive and, and, and there's nothing else in the engine that's made out of that same alloy. And so, the, from the fr from the scanning electron microscope report, we can generally get a pretty good idea of where the where the metal is is likely coming from. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the time, the metal's coming from some place that can be remedied with without tearing the engine apart. Right. Uh, I believe you found some <laughs> metal. Yeah, coming from, we're, we're uh, coming we're from just, something in your engine that turned out to be something. We're chasing one it. right now, exactly, yeah. that follows right along this story with a new adapter that went on and the oil filter opened up and had uh, uh, a number, uh, a fair number uh, of hair like brass looking gold colored non ferrous pieces that could be found there and, and, and did that, sent it in. Uh, 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 for analysis, which did come out as, as being parts that, that do point to the adapter itself. And, uh, and then, you know, I think the other thing that you have to be wary of with that, uh, on one hand, pay, like, pay close attention and follow it, but on the other hand, be a little wary of is once you're doing that, you're going to find th other things. They're, they're, they're going to find, they do the scanning electron you know, microscope and they do a flush that you probably don't do every single oil change at that level. And so you, just like an oil analysis, you know, ours came back with, well, you've got these things and then you've got a few things, other things in small quantities to watch, which, which you know, everybody gets concerned about. But when I contacted the uh, adapter company, uh, they they said actually that's fairly normal in some cases we replaced the, the it's a brand new brass gear that got put in there 
and it's not uncommon to have some very fine hair-like pieces come off as that breaks in and meshes with the, the steel gears. And um, it, it goes along with, again, your, even your recommendation, which is don't jump to something, you know? Right. Run it for 10 hours and cut open the filter and see. Is it accelerating? Are we getting more? That, is that, it that's down? a really important point, Jeff. Uh, uh, then you anticipated my next comment, which is that in, in situations like this where the engine is making metal, one of the most important things that we need to find out is is uh, is what the first derivative is. It, you know, is it, which way is the needle moving? Is this a problem that is resolving itself over time, or is this a problem that's getting worse over time? Mm -hmm. And the way we do that is to shorten the oil change interval, sometimes to something very short, maybe 10 hours, and and, and get a series of, of, of data points to find out, you know, is this getting better? Is it getting worse? If it's getting better, we probably can relax. If it's getting worse, we probably should start getting more nervous about it. Um, but you, you can't tell that from just cutting open one filter and looking at it. You, you need mm -hmm. a series of data to, to find out what it's doing over time. Right. And that goes, I guess, back to that kind of uh, those comments from some of the old school mechanics, which is what, what, are, we, what are we really ultimately looking for? And, and what I mean by that is um, your decision of is there has to be something really substantial to say it's not safe for you to do that derivative analysis you just said. You have to, it better be dramatic to say that it's not safe enough to actually put another 10 hours and see if it's going up or going down. And that right. takes that's, a lot. That's, and that's, that's why something like the, the Lycoming uh, guidance is invaluable because the Lycoming guidance says, yes, this is what we want you to do. And it tells you, you know, based on how much metal you found, how long you should go before you sample again. And mm -hmm. it, 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 you know, that's, it's exactly the right kind of guidance. I mean, I, I'm not saying that I agree with every single jot and tittle of it, but it, but, but philosophically, it's exactly spot on as far as I'm concerned. It's a very measured approach and, and it relieves the mechanics of having to make that risk management decision uh, and mechanics are typically not trained to do that you know so that they, they they will if left to their own devices they're, they're always going to do something super ultra conservative because they're very concerned about liability right but if lycoming was... says oh well it's okay you know go run the engine for 10 hours and then 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 you know check it again or go take it out on the ramp for half an hour and then go check it again. The, right. The mechanic, if the manufacturer says that, then the mechanics are okay with it. Right. Because then if anybody questions it, they can say, well, we, we did it by the book. And I would say also, by all means, and I definitely did this, go to the, go to the manufacturer. I mean, I, and, and someone asked a question, you know, do you change the oil? I, no, you just change, in my case, I'm just changing the filter because that's what I'm looking for is what's being caught, mm -hmm. not that. But I do want, you know, a, a really Im important shout out to Continental because I didn't just go to the air, the uh, uh, we got the analysis back on the uh, on the material and what it was. And then uh, I called Continental and Continental in their M0 manual has information there that has to do with sources of materials, possible sources of materials. But they're also right there on the phone. And when I called their technical support line, they were great. They just. You know, they took all the information. They wanted to see pictures of the oil filter. So I will say one piece of information they gave me to everyone out there, whatever you do, don't throw out your filter. Like, get good yeah. pictures of it. Absolutely. Get good documentation. Keep it. And they're a great resource because they'll help you figure out what you should do and, and give you that guidance, which is, I think, for me, a lot more important then whatever my local mechanic's gonna say, if the aircraft engine manufacturer's gonna say, we think you should fly this thing for another 10 hours and try again. Right, if, if, for owners, if, if their mechanic says, I found metal in the filter, the very first thing should be, put that filter in a Ziploc bag, you know, put it in quarantine. We may need that, we, we may need that evidence.
Exactly. Absolutely. What uh, uh, any other types of areas that you look at and uh, and and want to see people be more incremental in their approach when they're when they're dealing with uh, uh, aircraft engines and when they're dealing with their mechanics? Um, well, well, we we, we we always want people to 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 be incremental. Well, I'm not even sure that's the right word, but I mean the very first thing that we want anytime there's an issue is to gather as much data as we can mm -hmm. before we start the therapy. You know, we, we, we need to do a diagnosis before we can do the therapy. When, when, you know, we do this 24 seven breakdown assistance service. So we get calls of hours of the day or night with people who are, who are off in Sheep Dip, Nebraska and I think they have a problem with their airplane. And, we, we, we try to persuade them not to put their airplane in a shop until we, we have wrung out of them all the data we possibly can. And you know, typically the way those phone calls work is we start asking 20 questions. Mm -hmm. so, so the first thing we want to do is, 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 is capture what the owner thinks he saw that caused him concern and and to try to 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 capture his recollection of the symptoms while they're still fresh in his mind then we're typically going to ask him to try various things you know if it's an electrical problem we'll ask him to to try pulling circuit breakers or flipping switches and you know telling us what the ammeter says and all that kind of you know 20 question stuff to try to get as much information as we possibly can if the aircraft is equipped with a digital engine monitor, which um, I think now more than half the fleet is, we'll want to get we'll want to get him to download the the digital engine monitor data and let us take a look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and and by the way, it's the digital engine monitor data nowadays reports on a lot more than just the engine because typically you get a lot of information about electrical systems and other things that are captured in that. In that data, um, they, they, I remember a few years ago we had this marvelous uh, thing where we, 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 we were able to remotely diagnose a, a, an electrical problem on an airplane that was in Iceland on a on a round the world mission. It was a Cirrus SR22 being flown by a pilot from Africa, airline pilot, and he he, he was trying to be the first. African national to fly an airplane around the world, and uh, he he wound up having an, an electrical failure uh, going into Iceland. And since the Cirrus is an all electric airplane, electrical failure have to take pretty darn seriously. Mm. And uh, the mechanics in in Reykjavik had not a clue. They 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 never worked on a Cirrus electrical system before, and the Cirrus has a pretty complicated electrical system with dual everything and everything in a in a, in a in a big uh, um, junction box that, that contains all of the interesting stuff, and th they were telling me he's gonna he was gonna have to order a new master control unit from from Cirrus that would have taken about ten days to show up and was gonna cost him three thousand dollars. And so we looked at his engine monitor data and it was able to determine from the engine monitor data that there actually was nothing at all wrong with his electrical system. Uh, and, and that replacing that very expensive box that would have set his trip back for 10 days wasn't, wasn't going to make any difference whatsoever. And that what he had was an indication problem, not an electrical system problem. And the indication problem was due to to the failure of a, of a whole different box, uh, an analog to digital converter, which was, was what was feeding information to his MFD to be displayed, and it was giving him a bogus display. And he was able to continue his trip, uh, get the, the little A to D converter change when he got to England, where there was a proper Cirrus service center that, that kind of knew what they were doing. and. He, he made the trip successfully, but it was it was pretty neat to yeah. be sitting in California diagnosing a, a, a Cirrus's electrical problem in Reykjavik, Iceland. I mean, it just yeah. 
showed the power of, of this technology. You know, it's, it's really quite remarkable. Yeah, it has been amazing what you're able to do with that technology at Savvy and by looking at engine data and things like that. Um, you know, one area I want to make sure of that we've also seen a lot of tickets come across uh, before we run out of time is also, you know, the importance of making sure your mechanic uh, follows the proper procedures, this train knows what they're doing in some of these things. We've seen problems with mechanics in there and not following the right steps when they put on a cylinder uh, or, or doing, the, you know, d different things that either cause ring scoring inside, things like that. And I know, you know, in my case, I um, uh, put on uh, new cylinders and had, I had a Continental Service Center uh, do it down in Fairhope, Alabama. And I, I learned a ton watching their procedures and how they went about doing it. And in my case, all made sense. I had the old ECI cylinders that were, had ADs on them and turned out to have some cracks in there. And, um, but, you know, having things done the right way, uh, it prevents a lot of problems to begin with. So they let you hand, hang around and take pictures while all this is going they on? They did. We made a video. Oh, pretty cool. Now, that must have been a very interesting experience. It was. You know, they. Uh, I, I was excited just to go down there and see how that crew who had these guys who were old school guys too, they had stories and stories of how they could, you know, <laughs> redo engines in two days when they were at their peak of churning things through and and uh, yeah, they knew they just knew like the back of their hand what they were doing through that. And I'm just yeah, I'm just watching and videoing. <laughs> Anyone wants to see that's on Social Flight's YouTube channel. But it was it very very cool stuff to to see, and and unfortunately sometimes we see the opposite of that when we're dealing with people that have problems that we see lots of scraping in a cylinder or something like that, and we go hmm, you know the cylinder comes with a little instruction thing that says you know, gap the rings or do this or do that. Did Can you find out if that was done? And yeah. people are like, yeah, we don't know. Yep. We have seen rings installed upside down. <laughs> and, and they have the word T-O-P stamped on one side of them, but they, they somehow get installed upside down. Wow. Well, uh, listen, in our remaining time, I want to make sure because these are just, there are tons and tons of questions that people have coming in. And of course, we can't answer those now, but that is why Savvy exists and has the QA service, has the breakdown service, has the maintenance and actually the management service, pre-buy, et cetera. So why don't you tell us about how people can get all of these questions answered and uh, all the other levels that they actually get them to have uh, you, Mike Bush, on their side moving forward. Well, of, co of course, we have a we, we have a a very rich uh, website at, at savvyaviation.com. Um, if you go to the top menu, there's a, a one of the things you can select is something called resources, and we've got a resources site with just an immense wealth of information. Um, Things about have how you lap valves and how you do ring flushes and uh, 10 years worth of my magazine articles in AOPA Pilot and EAA Sport Aviation and um, uh, about 150 webinars on our YouTube channel and it's just a, a tremendous wealth of information there. So um, uh, that's that's a really good thing. Also, there's a there's a contact us forum on the on the website, which um, I shouldn't tell you this, but if somebody submits a contact us form, guess who gets it? Me. And then, <laughs> you know, frequently I'll respond to it. If I don't, I'll I'll, I'll send it to 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 you know one of our uh, one of our team who's who's a specialist in the area being asked about. But probably about half of them I answer myself. Um, and we um, we have a weekly uh, 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 mailing that we send out that um, once a month we send out a, a newsletter, an email newsletter, and the uh, and the rest of the weeks we typically send out write-ups of interesting maintenance stories that have happened to our clients. Uh, uh, 
that, that, that make some pretty interesting reading and pretty interesting case studies and, and kind of will we'll give uh, folks a really good idea of, of what our philosophy of life is and how we, how we work with, with our clients to help them get better maintenance and more cost efficient maintenance and try to deal with some of the, 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 the over maintaining, over reaction kind of things that, that you were talking about earlier uh, this evening. So uh, if anybody wants to get get on that mailing list and is not on the mailing list, the easiest way to do that is to uh, is to pull out your phone, text the word savvy s a v v y to the number three three seven seven seven, and uh, that will activate a little text bot that'll ask you for your email address, and you'll get on the list and start receiving newsletters and maintenance stories and stuff once a week. I'm learning stuff all the time. I didn't even know about that. So you text yeah, savvy. That, we, Text Savvy, give us that number again. Yeah, it's a, it texts the word S-A-V-V-Y to the number 33777. Three, we three, actually, seven, we actually seven, came seven. up with that prior to AirVenture because we always have this problem of people wanting to get on our list at AirVenture, and I never had a good way to, to tell them how to do that. So we came up with this text thing and for AirVenture, and it worked very well, and we decided we were just going to keep it active. Excellent. And of course, you've got a variety of services, so I would encourage everyone to go to Savvy Maintenance uh, and, and check out all of the different services. There's pretty much a level for anyone out there. Uh, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm learning a ton. I continue to learn, and, uh, and it's just great to, to have Mike and his team on your side and, and continue to learn about things like this. Well, uh, Mike, I, I hope you'll uh, come back on the show and we'll... Uh, We'll continue to do uh, more topics and, and, and dive deeper into maintenance. Of course. We never seem to run out of things to talk about, do we? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's always the top I, of the I hour think, that I comes think that, up. I think that will continue. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love um, to come back. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Mike, for joining us. And, uh, and, and I appreciate it very, very much. Oh, you bet. And thank you to all of you for joining us here on Social Flight Live, for taking time out of your evening, as always, to join us here. We have inspirational guests coming every single week. Next week, Apario President Chris Garberg is here to talk about all the different things happening there from, from Stratus and new developments all the way through to their uh, camera for the cockpit. There's a lot of cool things coming from the, uh, them and that company. Very, very exciting things that we saw at NBAA with them. In addition to that, on November 23rd, Tuesday at 8 p.m., as always, Ariel Tweedo will be here. So excited to have her back. She's such a wonderful, wonderful guest from Flying Wild Alaska. And then on November 30th, Elvis's pilot, Ron Strauss, will be joining us. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight. Blue skies. Thank you.